What's happening, everybody? Today we're going to be talking about Gwent. I have here with me David, who goes by the name of Panda, um, and he is one of the top players in the world currently in Gwent, and he's made some really good posts about uh, the decks that are here, that, that the decks that he is playing over on Reddit, and that's how I connected with David. So I thought it'd be really good to bring David in and just get his take on, um, you know, dig through his mind, like. What's his mindset when he's playing? How does he make decisions? How does he make decisions when he's building decks? And you know how has he risen to really the top of the field within Gwent? So um, welcome, David. So uh, let's just, I'll let you introduce yourself. Tell me just a little bit about yourself, um, your competitive gaming background, other games that you've played. All right, that was quite the introduction. Um, well, my name's David, but most people know me as Impetuous Panda or Nullskog, depending on what name I'm using, on what platform. And yeah, I've been gaming for my whole life pretty much. Um, I haven't really played too many card games, to be honest. I played Hearthstone for a little while, I tried it out, but I never, it never really stuck with me and I only got, I got to Legend, but I didn't really play past like maybe a month or two or three. I don't know the exact time frame, but I didn't really play too much. I remember I was playing when Face Hunter was popular. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and that was the deck I was playing because it was really fast to climb, so uh-huh. that really helped me. And uh, aside from that, I've played a lot of games in my life, obviously. I've been playing since I was a little kid. And I did compete uh, semi professionally on Call of Duty mm-hmm. here in. I live in Spain. I'm not. I sound like I'm from the US because I lived there when I was little, but I live in Spain currently. And I did attend some tournaments over here and in, around Europe and Amsterdam as well, but I never really got to anything too, you know, high up on the sure. circuit, so nothing too serious, but I did compete in that game. So what's your what's your MMR and, like, ranking um, this last month been? Uh, it fluctuates a lot, surprisingly. I mean, not really surprisingly, because I have reached, like, top five was my highest rank, I think, with the Chicago Control deck. And then I got back up to top 10 with a different deck with uh, Skoya Tall Control. But it fluctuates a lot more than people think. People think that you reach top 10 and that just like sets you in stone as like a top 10 player and like, you're like a top 10 in the world. And it sounds great, you know, to like, oh yeah, I'm so, I'm so good. I'm one of the best players in the world. But it fluctuates a lot. For my, in my case, uh, it's because of disconnections a lot. Mm-hmm. I don't know if it's on my end or the game servers or what, mm-hmm. but... I'm pretty confident I can say I lose more points to disconnections than to actual losses, mm. which you can imagine is very frustrating. But yeah. So it fluctuates a lot. Sometimes I wake up and I'm top 10 and I can stay there the whole day, or sometimes I drop from top 10 to top 300 and then I have to climb back up again. So uh, it fluctuates every day pretty much. So how do you deal with that? Because that, I mean, uh, for Hearthstone and Gwent, the thing that gets me is like frustrating, just bad beats, and it, those it, it really makes me frustrated, and I have to just walk away from my computer sometimes. Um, how do you deal with like getting disconnected and losing that precious rank? If I'm at the top, like I'm already in the top twenty or so, it's frustrating because obviously the goal is to get the top one, and you can't really like the, to be the top player in the ladder. You can't really lose at all with disconnections or anything because you already lose enough just from bad uh, hands at the start of a game or bad mulligans. So it just adds like a little aspect that's add to your win rate. Like, oh, I have 10%, you know, my loss is because of disconnection. So it's really frustrating. But once I drop out of the top like 100 or so, I really don't mind because I know I can get back up there with a string of good games. So I just try other decks or, you know, do other not so serious um, uh, decks really in rank. Okay, so like you... You have this confidence that you can get back up there so it doesn't bother you so much when you, you lose yeah, because you understand exactly. it's part of the process, right, I guess? Yeah. yeah. Like right now, I think I dropped a lot because I've been trying different decks out. Mm-hmm. I was playing with Bran a bit, trying out different stuff. I'm going to try some Queen's Guard stuff later today, and I think I'm like uh, 400th now or 500. Like I dropped a lot, but I don't really mind at all because I know in like one night I can just play my ST control or, or Scalga control and climb back up. Okay. To like top fifty or top twenty. Nice. Without too much of a problem. So like how much um how many hours do you put in per day to be able to climb up that high? Um at least I mean it depends. When you're when 
the patch has been stale for a few for like a week or two i stopped playing so i play once the patch hits i play a lot because obviously it's all very new and the meta is very new so it's kind of exciting i guess so i might play like i don't know uh five hours a day maybe okay so that's really not too much to be you know top five yeah i mean it depends maybe like the day it drops i play like like eight or nine but it depends really how you know excited i am to play sure but really it's, it's really not not that much compared to um, other games um, yeah talk about okay so this is the part i'm going to cut out from the video <laughs> okay yeah uh oh yeah, yeah that's what i want to ask so talk about hearthstone versus gwent so you said you played hearthstone a little bit so like what i did pulled you into gwent uh, more and made you right want to push for number one in I think from what I, I don't remember too much from Hearthstone because I did play like a, a year and something ago and it's all kind of diluted, but it just seems more complex to me. It like you can your decision making and your deck building, it all matters more. I think in Hearthstone it was like kind of a lot of RNG, a lot of I remember Doctor Boom was popular in that meta when I was playing, and the uh, piloted Shredder if I remember the name correctly. Yep. And it was just a lot of RNG that you couldn't really uh, prepare for. So Gwent has very little RNG. It's a lot more like you can trust the cards to do what they're supposed to do. And you can trust your deck to fulfill a purpose within the game. If you get, you know, semi-consistent card draw and, and a good hand at the start of the game. So the only thing that really matters in Gwent uh, when it comes to luck is the hand at the beginning of the game. And your top deck's obviously in round two and three. But it matters much less than in Hearthstone, I think. Mm, yeah, no, I would I would totally agree with you there. That um, I feel like there's in Gwent there's even a wider um, array of decisions to make because you're not limited by mana. I feel like Hearthstone, right? You're so limited by mana that each turn, the first five turns, it's it's really obvious what you should play, and it's kind of the the game is kind of dictated by the arbitrary mana point. Where I feel like Gwent, you have just a lot more decisions you can make because play any of your cards at any time yeah exactly i mean i don't want to belittle hearthstone because I, I really don't remember it uh perfectly to really compare the two games that well but from what i do remember it's just gwen seems way more complex in decision making in just the way the cards work i think there's abilities and and uh sequencing in gwen that doesn't exist exist in hearthstone at all uh, and obviously Hearthstone has more abilities more uh, or more different uh, things that can happen or effects that the cards make, but because it's been out for a lot longer. I think once Gwent settles and the game comes out and more factions come out and more cards, it's going to surpass uh, Hearthstone in both the complexity of the abilities and the way you sequence them and also just the quality of how they work. Like it's not RNG, it's actually stuff you can you can prepare for and you can think out and you can outplay your opponent, which is really what it, what it comes down to in card games. Yeah, absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree with you there. That's what drew me into Gwent um, is that it just feels, the games feel much more based on my decisions rather than an arbitrary thing like um, curving out, right? So that's that's what makes me joy Gwent more than Hearthstone right now because it feels um, my decisions feel much more impactful in Gwent. I, I've yeah, never had a game where I felt like I lost because of just you know bullshit. It was always I was like, oh, if I played this differently last turn, then I probably could. Not. Yeah, it's more rewarding. And when you make a mistake, you know you made a mistake, and you know that mistake can probably cost you the game. But it feels better to lose to something that you know you could have changed and you could make better for the next time than to just something randomly happen. I mean, there is still RNG in Gwen. You, you can still draw a really bad card. Uh, round three, you have, like, three options, and you get the worst one. That doesn't win you the game or stuff like that. But in general, it's just a lot more rewarding. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and jump in and talk about um, this current patch and the, the game itself. So who do you feel are the strongest factions um, currently? So we're recording this on April 7th. So uh, the patch dropped, what, about two weeks ago? Yeah, about two weeks, yeah. I'd say, yeah. So let's talk about the uh, strongest factions, in your opinion, right now. I think, well, before talking about the strongest faction, I think you have to, I, I at least point out uh, four different disciplines that I think a deck needs to be strong. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. Which are card advantage, 
for me would be card advantage. Um, having cards that can cause big tempo swings. Okay. Uh, a round three finisher. So something that you can pull round three and few amount of cards that can win you the game. And consistency. Can you give us some examples of cards that can cause a big tempo swing? And what that would look like in the game itself? So, for example, um, for Skoyatel, the biggest card is Saskia. Okay. It can create, like, when the, both boards are really advanced, so, like, turn six or seven or eight in round one, it can cause, you know, at least a 30-point swing. Mm. So, I mean, that's that's a lot, especially because Skoyatel, um, its bronze units are really bad. Like, they're not... Their effects are good, but they're, they're obviously their strength isn't good. Like, an Elven Merc is four... The archers and the dragoons are all five, so they just really don't do much by themselves apart from like thinning your deck and using spells and stuff. Mm. So what Sasuke does is since you have a lot of them, especially with like Isengrim, where you keep on spawning the commando neophytes every time you use a spell, um, you have so many units on board that using wow. Sasuke is you know a lot of points on your board. It demolishes the end of opponent's wow. board, and it's a very strong gold body, like a seven strength gold body. So it can create huge swings. Awesome. So I guess Sasuke would be an example of like a turn three win condition. Well, or would you would you want to play him early? I, he's definitely the more units on board, the better. So round one, he's definitely the most effective. He's yeah. still a good card round three, especially with Roach, because you pull Roach out. That's already a ten point play plus you know the one point to Roach. That's eleven points, and you damage whatever whatever's on the enemy's board. But it's way more effective round one. Yeah. So uh, let's give an example of like a turn three win condition. For Skoya till now, it's the, the buffing strategy where they use Dragoons to buff one unit to, you know, 17, 18, 19, or 20 strength, mm -hmm. depending on what unit you're buffing. And a Goliath is also a good uh, unit for round three. Having those two cards makes you, if you have card advantage, makes you pretty much unbeatable. Because a Goliath can do anything, really, with your spells. She's very versatile. So she gets, she's a five body plus Roach. That's already eight. And then she can scorch the enemy's strongest unit. She can also wear thunder or whatever, you know, a threat that you have to kill. She can, if you still have units, she can rally another unit. She can really do anything with all your spells. So she's very versatile. And then with the card advantage that Skoyato has, you almost always place your very buffed unit last. So the enemy can't really answer to it. They can't scorch it. They can't igni it. They can't, you know, do really anything about it. Good. So let's go over those, those four things again. It's card advantage... Um, having cards that can create big tempo swings, a turn three win condition, and what was the other? Uh, thinning and consistency. Squares does that really very well because where the Skull Control deck that I use with the Axeman is very powerful, the one thing it lacks is consistency. Because there's no way to guarantee you get your gold cards when you need them. There's no way you guarantee you get Axeman round one. So it's a deck that when it works, it works very well. And I did get it into the top five precisely because I went on a string of, of, you know, good games and lucky games where I had a good hand at the start, which makes the deck almost unbeatable if you play it right. But the one problem is you don't have any cards that thin the deck. So the same way Skoyatel has Elven Mercs to pull, you know, all your spells out and not have that, you know, buffering your draws in round two and three. Um, Skoyatel doesn't really have that, so... You end up the game with, you know, maybe 10 or 11 cards still in your deck or, you know, eight or nine. And those cards can be, you know, all your, it can be Corral, it can be Yen Con, it can be uh, Wild Boar of the Sea, it can be all your gold cards, you know. So you don't really have a say in what you draw at the start. Hmm. So do you think that, what do you think needs to change in Gwent um, for people to start seeing like, cards or decks that have more than 25 cards because generally most decks are running 25 cards and most people are running um, deck thinning, right? Just to get more consistency. Do you think it's ever possible that we're going to see decks that are in the 30 to 40 card range? And how, how would that work, do you think? That would never happen unless you had cards that specifically overdrew your deck so you could draw all 30 cards in a game Then and, and it gave you some kind of bonus to doing so then that could work the same way you can have a deck with Siri Dash that have 26 or 27 cards because if you draw all your cards with Siri Dash and you have her in round two, for example, and you have no cards left to draw, 
she'll go back into your deck and round three you'll draw her again with the plus three strength bonus so she pretty much adds to your deck every round so you could have a maximum of 27 cards and you could still draw all of them because siri dash acts as a like an extra card in your deck every time the round passes but aside from that i don't see it ever happening now okay interesting so um, let's talk about deck building right now since we're on the on this topic so um so right, so we have those four things to keep in mind. So where do you where do you start when you're building a deck? Like how do you what's what's your thought process like when you're experimenting you, and trying? A... You have to find cards that work well with each other. So you have to find synergy between first of all the leader ability, because choosing a leader is pretty much what you should do at the start of a deck. In most cases, in some cases, it doesn't really matter what leader you have because none of them help you fulfill your win, your win condition so it doesn't really matter but in most cases um you have to have a leader ability that synergizes with the card you're choosing and cards that synergize between each other so for example in my Skalga control deck um i have axemen are the main the main basic unit in the deck everything revolves around the axemen pretty much just to most to like some degree there are cards that can you know win games like if you have a a a raging berserker that's transformed into a savage into a raging bear. That's like a thirteen strength unit in round three. So you don't need axemen to win round three. But the deck still revolves around axemen. So you pick units that help the axemen thrive, pretty much. And you have a leader ability that also helps the axemen. Obviously, herald does damage to enemy units and it buffs the axemen. So everything synergizes with each other. Okay, so that that was kind of your basic premise on the uh, skeleton control deck is you want to. Um, find all the cards that you could that would synergize with Axemen. Um, and then do you, how do you, so once you do that, how do you go about refining the deck? Like, how do you, I I find a hard, I have a hard time with that is I'll um, throw a deck together and I'll play and, you know, I'll lose, but it's, it's a lot of times it's hard to see like what I should be cutting. So for example, like you have two copies of Raging Berserker in your uh, Skelly control deck, so like you know, why two copies of Raging Berserker and not three? And you know, why why three archers rather than three berserkers and two archers? Like, what are those? How do you make those kind of decisions? You have to think in situations what cards would help you or not help you, and, and like when they're dead cards, for example. So I used to run. I've been switching between one Stamilfords and two Stamilfords because. Or for example, three Raging Berserkers and two Raging Berserkers because, uh, first of all, Raging Berserkers, once you transform them, if you have two of them in, in round one, it they can be Ignite, mm -hmm. unless you like do the second stagger with another archer, which is just, it adds a lot of steps into your game plan that shouldn't be there. So that's a risk that you shouldn't be taking, and drawing Raging Berserkers, um, drawing all three of them, for example, is just a huge threat at being Ignite, and you only really need one to work properly you only have you have two in your deck because it adds consistency to drawing at least one in round one or two but you only really need one because the main point of the raging berserker is it gives you some power obviously round one but it's mostly a finisher with uh sigurd reef or king of beggars in round three you res you know uh sigurd reef into king of beggars into a freya into a raging bear and that's like a 27 point play okay awesome so that makes sense so let's let's um pull back a little bit and talk more for kind of the new player, the average player. So what do you think are the top mistakes that um, the average player is making that's that's keeping them at like a, you know, 2,000, 3,000 MMR versus being able to climb into the 4,000s? Well, I think the main most important aspect is, especially once a new patch hits, you have to understand what changed in the patch, what cards changed, why something works or why something worked before and now it doesn't. And also what people are going to be playing. When I play against any deck at the high MMRs, and you can do this at any MMR really because most people, unless they haven't, they don't have, they don't have the scraps to craft the legendary, everyone pretty much uses net decks. So they use whatever decks are on GwentDB or on Reddit or on Discord or whatever people are using or whatever they watch, you know, streamers use. So you can tell from... As soon as like the first few cards are placed, what, exactly what deck the enemy is playing, and you know exactly how to prepare for that. So it's really important to not only play your deck well and understand what your deck is going to do and what 
limits it has and why you should be doing something first or something last but also understanding how your enemy can counter it it's not just you're not just playing you know solitaire it's not you're playing on your board you have to prepare for the enemy to answer to whatever you're trying to build on your board mm. do you have a process for kind of researching other people's decks do you just go play them or do you uh, search your videos or what's your process like for learning other people's decks Normally, you just look on Gwenty B or Reddit or Discord, whatever people are using or whatever streamers are using. After one or two days, um, the meta is pretty set in stone after a patch hits because most of the top players that you know play a lot of hours in that time frame, they already have their deck set in stone, whatever works or what doesn't. There isn't really that much of a change where a deck works really well in a patch, and you know two weeks later, without anything changing, it stops working. Doesn't really happen that much. So you just have to find out what people are using, what decks became um, important, and then you just tech. So you change your deck to answer or to protect your units from whatever answers the enemy has with their decks. Sure. So I guess like a good example is if you're playing your X-Men deck and you face an ST deck, you know they're probably running a Scorch and they're probably running an Aglius. And so you you would want to play around two Scorches. Um, so yeah. I guess... How would you do that? Because that's that's what I've always had trouble. I tried your X Men deck a little bit, but um, I found I was really vulnerable to like scorches and to a, a certain extent ignis. Um, yeah. So what you would do is, if you know the enemy has a scorch or igni, or in the case of they only have weather, um, you save your big. So I would save Harold, for example, mm -hmm. as much as possible because it doesn't matter if he ignis a. 13 strength Axeman or a 27 strength Axeman. He was going to use that Igni or that Scorch at that time because he had to due to his play. So if you can save yeah. that Herald, you know, that, that one card that's going to give you a lot of value in round mm -hmm. one, you can let him Scorch your, you know, kind of strong Axeman and then just res it and then use Herald. Mm -hmm. So, and you make him use another Scorch or another answer to that. So you can just do that multiple times. It comes down to what their cards in hand are and how many answers they have to Axeman. Sure. Okay, so um, so knowing your opponent's deck is really important. What other things, what other mistakes do you think um, the average player is making that if they fix, they could become much better? I think it comes down to that and to the order you play your cards in. Like, when you know the enemy's deck, you know what, how you can... So, for example, um, when I played, I made a Square Tall Control deck. Um, I changed some things to the ones people were using because I thought it was better. And then as soon as I started playing that deck, a Henselt gilding variant became popular. That ran Siege Towers, obviously. And it became pretty... It was used at the, you know, pretty high rank. So um, it went from no not seeing any Northern Realms at all or very little to seeing, you know, a decent amount of it in a day or two. So then I changed my deck. I took out a Marksman from my Skeletal deck and I put in a Manticore Venom just to deal with that Hensel deck. So if I don't run into that Hensel deck, I run into a Monsters deck, well, I mean, Manticore Venom's not a bad card, especially with, you know, it synergizes with Elven Mercs, with uh, Isengrim, it's another spell. So it's not a bad card, but it makes the Hensel matchup, like, without exaggerating, a lot easier, like, a lot, a lot easier. And it's a bronze unit, so it really shouldn't matter that much, but it makes it a lot easier. So knowing what cards you're... I think that's the, the biggest thing just knowing how to order your cards and what to say for later and what to use now and what the order you make your plays in, pretty much. Okay. I think I have a lot of trouble with that because I I, I was running into the same thing. A lot of uh, Northern Realms who like to play um, right those Siege Towers and then play a bunch of uh, poor infantry and all that, and I, I just kind of counted. I was like, well, my deck is bad against Northern Realms, so... I mean, I was playing a ST deck, so it sounds like I could have improved if I would have just uh, teched a little bit more. So can you talk about, maybe give us some more examples of recent techs you've made uh, as the meta has shifted with both your ST and your Skellig and maybe other decks that you play? Yeah, um, with Skellig, the only big difference was as soon as the patch hit, a lot of people were playing Northern Realms with poor infantry, and they were mostly spamming the melee row, Gilding the melee row with, you know, seven or eight or nine units because they had field medics and poor infantry and not uh, gilding their siege towers. They would just let their siege towers 
get to really high values and not guild them or build them, you know, after that play. So it was really easy to counter them with Galagog because I ran two Frosts. So, and they normally ran maybe one First Light at maximum. So I would just Frost, and if they First Light it, I could um, still deal with it. I had another Frost to deal with it. Or I could just use Blue Boy Lugos and the Whale, the Spectral Whale on their side of the field. Um, it makes it, it moves uni- uh, rows like as soon as their turn starts. So if I Frost and the row isn't on the melee row, the Whale, it has a 50% chance to move on that row and kill the units without the enemy being able to respond to it, without being able to clear it. So it was very easy to play against Northern Realms. But then Northern Realms stopped, they stopped playing the melee row pretty much. So Frost became a lot less valuable in the Skull of the deck. I took one out. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so one question I have is, how do you decide when to pass? That's another decision that sometimes isn't very clear for me in games. Um, yeah. I guess part of it is because I don't know my opponent's deck as well. So like I'm not sure what he has in his hand and what he's, uh, what his game plan is and what he's trying to play. So I guess part yeah. of it is that. But um, talk through a couple of scenarios. Like when do you decide to pass? Like especially first round. So let's talk about first round. Like how do you decide when to pass or when to press? Go all in. Um, how is that decision made? I think that's the most complex part of Gwent, in my opinion. Um, knowing when to pass and how to manage card advantage into round two and three. I think that's by far the hardest aspect of Gwent. Um, and it comes down to understanding the game plan the enemy has. So, for example, the Skalga deck, um, they want a very drawn out round, so a very long round. So, round one, they tend they normally want to win it, but they don't mind losing it very quickly yeah. and going on to round two and making that their drawn out round because they win two rounds to win the game, right? So one round you win it with an Axeman uh, centered display. So buffing your Axeman, the more units are played, the better because Herald's going to do more damage, Stamil Force is going to do more damage. So in general, the longer the round is, the higher chance you have of winning it with Axeman. And then a very short burst round where you have Sigurd Drifa into King of Beggars, into Freya, into Raging Bear, and like a Wild Boar or a Corral. And that's how you win the games pretty much with Skalliga. And it's the same with a lot of decks. Northern Realms, it's the same thing. Instead of buffing Axemen, they're buffing their, their Siege Towers by gilding and pumping out a lot of units with Field Medics and Priscilla and Dandelion and all that stuff. And then around three where they use uh, Shani into uh, Priscilla again or Neke and then they can use Villain Tremeth to kill everything that's not gold which is pretty much everything on your side so most decks have a game, pl- a very clear game plan on how to win two rounds and lose one round and so so like at uh, maybe it would be good to have a concrete example if you're playing your Delic deck against say like in Northern Realms um, you think of instances when you've been playing say maybe you've played five or six cards into round one, but then you decided to pass, or is that... For round one with the Skellige deck, um, if I don't have any Axemen, like in my hand, I, I just don't have any way to draw any Axemen. I had bad luck with my card drawn, I don't have any Axemen, or I don't have, you know, Yankon or any real activators for Axemen. It's, you have to come to the decision to either pass that round by... Like, knowing you're going to pass the round, so you play low-tempo plays or, or less valuable plays and make the enemy draw out, you know, draw out all their good plays. So their gold cards, all their set of cards, pretty much. So with, with Northern Realms, if I don't have an answer to their Siege Towers and they're just, you know, putting down two or three Siege Towers up to the, five, the first, you know, five or six turns, the enemy doesn't know that I want to pass, but I do so. What you do is make them play as many uh, valuable cards as they have and make them guild their siege towers and make them... Because once they guild, it's over pretty much because their siege towers grow to like 12 or 16 each and the enemy can then pass because you can't really do anything against a 50-point difference on the board, especially if all all his units are golden so you can't even like scorch them or igni them or weather them. So you pretty much have to decide as a, as the round goes on and depending on the strength level each you know person has on the board you have to know when to pass or when to like you can play a spy into northern realms so you can play uh donar or you can play gavin as as Skoyatel, 
And most of the time, you can if if the enemy passes at, the, at that point in time, you can still use Herald and come back, or you can still use Saskia and come back and win it, or Scorch with a Gleis or without a Gleis and win the round. But if the enemy doesn't pass, he's forced to guild pretty much. To guild all his units and save and waste his leader ability, and he's two cards down because he used a spy. Mm -hmm. So when you when you're gonna lose round one, you have to do it on your terms and you have to do it where you win card advantage or you uh, make them draw out their golds or their Isengrims or their their Saskias or their Glyce. So at least you have somewhat of an, an advantage uh, round two and three, even if you lost round one. Sure. So let's talk about um, when your opponent passes. So that's another question I have. Quite often, is say um, your opponent passes, like you can use one card to come back and win. That's a pretty obvious decision. Um, do you ever use two plus cards to come back if your opponent has passed? Depends how much card advantage I have on him. If okay. the maximum I normally the my norm normally my rule is to not go more than one card down. So the average you should be looking at is winning rounds by playing one extra card. So always being one card under your opponent. If you win the round being even on cards, your opponent's at a big disadvantage. Mm. And if you win the round being up a card, then something went wrong for the opponent because that shouldn't be happening at all. So, like, so for example, going two cards down, I normally don't. It depends on really the game plan as monsters. Maybe if you, for example, uh, monsters against Scoia'tael in round two. If Scoia'tael used their faction ability, and they won round one, that means that round three, monsters would go first again, so they're forced to go first two rounds because they win round two. That's how it works in Gwen, pretty much. And as monsters, it doesn't matter if you use more cards in round two because you can use Grave Hag, for example, and the opponent's passed already, so they can't kill it. And as soon as round three starts, you have the first say, and like, you place the first card down, so you can use Karen and eat that you know 20 or 30 buffed Grave Hag and the enemy can't scorch it that way. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of intricate, you know, mostly you don't, you never go two cards down unless you're monsters, because monsters with a, with a carryover faction ability they have, it sometimes doesn't really matter because when it comes down to it being two cards down and having a 25 strength unit on board, it's probably beneficial because even in two cards, they can't, you know, match that strength. So it depends really. Okay. But by rule of thumb, never go more than one card down. So, okay, so that makes sense. Whatever. So if you're like if you're both at five cards, so if your opponent passes, he gets five cards, and it comes to your turn, and you have five cards, it's okay to go down to four, but not three, just generally as a rule of thumb. Yeah. Unless there's a specific, you know, situation on board that you can force that we able to make it okay, but that depends, you know, it's specific cases that would warrant it. Sure, absolutely. Um so that's pretty good. Let's go ahead and dive a little more in-depth on your two decks. So let's talk about your X-Men deck first, and maybe just talk through like the game plan that people want to have for round, um, you know, to, for winning the game. Well, it depends on the matchup, but it worked really well the first week of the patch because the decks that were mostly being played were Scoia'tael, which is obviously very strong, um, but you had answers to it. You had Igni for... If you, you can use a spy on their row and Igni, and that helped a lot. You had Corral for their round three. So when it came down to it, if you had card advantage round three, you could really mess up their plays with Corral because a lot of people played um, Elias and Teruvial, and most of the units are in the range row. So you could deal with that with Corral. And then the Frost also helped sometimes. They had buffed units in the melee row. So you had answers to Scoia'tael. And the big thing that I did against Squidtail that first week was, most people don't know this, but there was a nerf to uh, First Light, where before, when you used First Light, it would go into the graveyard as First Light, as the card First Light. But now, if you use First Light into Rally, only Rally goes into the graveyard, and not Clear Skies. So it doesn't divide, it divides it into two cards. So you have to, if you use Rally, then only Rally goes into your graveyard. So last patch, people used the Gleis to clear skies round three if anyone was using weather. But this patch, because Squirtle players normally use all three um, first lights in round one, and they use it to rally to thin out their deck with the Elven Mercs, they wouldn't have any clear skies, so they couldn't answer to your weather. So as soon as you saw three rallies in the graveyard, you could really do whatever you want mm -hmm. with weather. 
Interesting. And and aside from that, I mean, with Northern Realms, it was very easy because, like I told you before, everyone was running field medics and poor infantry in the melee row and running two frosts. I would leave my mulligan, I would leave two frosts in hand, which is the only time I'd ever do that, and it would be really easy to win the game as well. So how do you think uh, the X-Men deck fares now that it's... Uh... I think it's I think it's still really strong, but people have prepared for it better, especially after I posted it on Glen TV because no one was using it really in I mean I don't know if that's an effect of just the patch rolling out and people starting to try out other things or my deck specifically giving people the idea to use it. But there's a lot more X-Men now and people are more prepared to shut it down and you know they have more ways to counter it and not be countered by it. So Frost is a lot less useful now. People don't really play in the melee real much, so you can pr probably cut both Frost out of the Axeman deck now. And again, it comes down to consistency. I mean, the deck is good. It's very good when it works, but when it doesn't work and you don't draw a Yankon round one or Axeman round one, it's pretty hard to win, especially against really strong death decks like Squiretel mm -hmm. or Hensolt right now. So that, I think that was one of my issues when I tried out the deck. Um, I had a, a little more difficulty with my mulligan, deciding what to keep. So, kind of a rule of thumb: what are the what are the main cards you're looking to get round one? Um, and I guess you know it, it's definitely different for different factions. But uh, are there some just core key cards that you want to try to get every round or every game? There's a few rules that people don't really have in mind, especially lower MMR players, that are very important. Um, there's a thing with mulligan where you blacklist cards. I'm not sure if you're aware of it of the mechanic. Where if you have, for example, three first lights in your deck and the first card you mulligan is a first light, it blocks the possibility of the other first lights being, you know, coming up as your next card in the mulligan. So what that does is it guarantees you higher odds of drawing um, your gold and your silver since you're blacklisting two bronze units. Mm. So... Uh, that's you have to keep that in mind with Roach. So Roach is a hand is a card you obviously don't want in your hand because it it gets played automatically whenever you play a gold card. So that's the last card you want in your hand. So a lot of people normally mulligan it as a first card, but that's a mistake because if you have a first light in hand and you have Roach in hand and you mulligan Roach first, you can get a second first light, and then you just pretty much you know wasted a lot of your mulligan potential. So mm -hmm. always mulligan. A first light, for example, first. Like a unit you don't want in your hand, round one, and you can take away two more units with it by mulliganing it first. And the same with, in the Skalga deck, um, the Freyas, since you already have Sigurd Drifa and King of Beggars, you don't really want, you know, three or four revives in your hand in round one because you're not going to use that many cards, mm -hmm. and they'll be dead cards round one pretty much. So if I have King of Beggars and, and Sigurd Drifa, I normally mulligan my Freyas as well. I only keep, or maybe keep one Freya at maximum. But the Skylight guy would normally mulligan uh, Freya's, then an extra bear, a raging bear, if I had a raging berserker, because I don't really want two round one, or an archer, and then roach. So that's the order, pretty much. Hmm. And you're guaranteeing yourself higher odds at drawing, you know, your silvers, your golds, or your axemen. That's good. That that actually uh, brings a lot of clarity to it. Um, so one thing that I, I thought of as you were talking, um, can you talk a little bit about playing the spying units like uh, Donna Hindar? So I think when I first started, um, that was something that just didn't make sense to me. Like, I couldn't <laughs> fathom why I would want to give my opponent 13 strength, right? So talk about, you know, how to f use spies effectively, because it seems like every good deck runs at least one spy to give you card advantage. So uh, talk about that real quick. So the basic idea where, like, when you start playing the game is that you should, you know, find out pretty fast after you understand how the game works is you want to win two rounds. So the round you lose is the one you throw your spy out because you don't really care what the what the board state goes to. But it's important also that's pretty much called the bleeding round for most people. So you win round one, you bleed the enemy of cards round two, so you make them use their you know valuable cards, then you go into round three with a card advantage or equal on cards, but you have higher quality cards. So it's a higher chance you win the game. So that's where spies come in handy. Um, but... I guess a lot of people don't do this, but in round one, depending what what deck you're playing and how big of a tempo swing you can generate, I play my spies. I think I play my spies more on round one than round two, even. Hmm. 
especially with Koyatel, because you can, if you're up in cards, or if you can play your spy and be up in cards, so pretty much play your spy, and if they pass, you can play a card and be equal on cards, or be one card down, it's an okay play, because you are you have to win that round one with certain decks, with Axemen or with, with Koyatel, and you you gain you know you don't gain you don't gain the spies uh, card advantage because obviously you you win the round being one card down so it's like it's like you just won the round normally but it guarantees you win round one which is a big thing with, with some decks mm -hmm. and in some cases you can even play a spy into their board and still be up so you don't even have to play you know you don't you get the card advantage without having to play another card to win if they pass so that's even better but it depends what your future plays are going to be as well if you have a very strong round one and, a, and something they can't really shut down, so you have a lot of units on your board, you have Saskia ready to come in, you know, in the next two turns, and they don't have much going for them on their board, and you're still up in, in strength at that moment, that's the best time to use a spy, because they can't punish you for it at all. Hmm. Um, awesome. So we covered the Skellig deck pretty well, so let's go ahead and hop over to your ST deck and... Uh, Maybe talk a little bit about that. Talk about like your major win conditions and what makes this deck strong in your opinion. So Scoriatel as a faction is very strong because it excels in all four um, disciplines really and it's very consistent which is the one thing that Skellige lacks. It can also, um, luck does affect it because if you don't draw any gold cards in round one with the deck I'm using, you can't use King of Beggars into a Elven Merc because Roach is obviously not in play, so King of Beggars would draw Roach, which is your weakest unit. So that kind of, you know, there's luck also in round one and winning round one. But if you get Isengrim, for example, and Milva and uh, Saskia, and like you can draw scores at any time pretty much with the Elven Mercs, uh, you pretty much always win round one. And the difference with Skaliga is that you can win round one if you draw your gold cards. They, they both, you know, depend on their gold cards to win round one pretty much. But Skaliga ends up round three with, you know, eight or nine cards still in their deck. But Skoyatel ends up round three with maybe one or two cards in their deck. So you're guaranteeing you're drawing all four of your gold cards pretty much. And you're guaranteeing you're drawing all your Dragoons to buff your, your last unit and your Scourge, etc. So you have all your, your answers to the enemy's deck in play pretty much. So you can decide, you know, it's, it's going to come down to drawing those gold cards round one. That's the main like thing. If you, when I draw those cards, I know I pretty much won the game if I play it well. You don't depend on luck that much. That's why I think Squid Hill's a very strong deck because it's more consistent, and if it's more consistent, you can expect a higher win rate because you don't depend on top decks or card draws. Hmm. Very good. So let's talk about the Mulligan um, in this deck. What are you, uh, what are you trying to get rid of in your hand uh, when the game starts? The first thing is first lights, because what I said before, you blacklist the other two of them. So that's already two bronze units you don't have to deal with. And then you want a, a card you're going to buff with Dragoons, for sure. So at least one Archer or Teruvial, because those are the cards you normally buff. You don't want to buff you know, an Elven Merc or a Dragoon, because that doesn't make sense. Because if you buff an Elven Merc, that means you're, you're hindering, you're thinning, because you can't draw another spell with its ability. Or if you buff a Dragoon, that means when you play that final Dragoon... You're wasting, you know, for the its ability, which is buffing another unit, but you don't have any more units left round three, so that wouldn't make sense. Right. So basically, so it's almost the unit you buff is the unit you want to play like very last. Yeah, I never play. I very rarely, like maybe five percent of the time, play that buffed unit before my before round three. Like it's very unlikely. So you always want to do that. You want at least a, a buffable unit in your hand. You want. Um, some spells, not a lot of them, obviously, because you need Elven Mercs to be use useful. So if you have all your spells in your hand, then Elven Mercs aren't going to draw any spells. They're going to, you know, not have something to draw in round two or, round, or the end of round one. But I normally keep the spells that are most important in that matchup. So Scorch, you always keep in hand because that way you don't have to, you know, get a surprise Scorch all of a sudden where Elven Mercs pulls it out where you, what, at a time where you didn't want it or where it's not going to get the most value. And depending on the matchup, you want different spells. So against Northern Realms, you want Mandicore's Venom in hand because it lets you decide when to use it. So whenever you, the, you're going to kill the most amount of Siege Towers. 
For monsters matchup, you want uh, Allsworth Thunder in hand, so you can deal with uh, Arrakis Behemoth, which spawn the little spiders, or uh, the Vrand Warriors if you need to. So it kind of depends on the matchup, but in most cases, you I normally mulligan first lights, and then you don't want too many units in your hand because then the first lights aren't going to draw anything later on. So you don't want more than like four or five bronze units maximum in your hand. So I'd normally get rid of like a Dragoon or something because I could draw that with first lights and it's fine whenever you draw it. It's an okay play. And some spells as well. And then as many gold colors as possible. And obviously you don't want Roach in hand either. Sure. Um, but uh, can you talk about how to use Milva effectively? That was one thing that it took me a little bit to figure out when I first started playing the deck, like um, when you should play Milva. Yeah, Milva is really, really powerful, more than people give her credit for. Um, because she does something that no other card in the game does, just give you card advantage by adding strength to your board. Even if it's giving you a Roach, which is a, like a very low tempo play, it doesn't matter. It just matters that you have one more... Um, card to place at any point in time so you can use that roach to stall the game out in round one if you want to keep on playing but don't want to pass or like if the opponent gives you a spy and you don't have you don't want to pass because you know the opponent can um can equal out your score with one card and you don't have a spy to throw on their board then you can use roach which is a very low tempo play but it lets you stay in the round pretty much or just in round two for example and uh, you throw it out and you tra you're trading Roach for one of their better cards in round two because they can't decide to pass because you've won round one, obviously. So that's the one use that Milva has. So round one, if you have to go first, you use Milva. And that gives you card advantage for free. And against monsters, she's very useful. And against Skaliga Axeman because she returns the strongest unit on the board and that board doesn't retain their buffs. So if it's in green, if it has green numbers, it's not, if it's not a base strength buff, then when it returns to your hand, it loses that buff. Mm. So against what I like to do against Vran Warriors in the Monsters matchup is as soon as it has one tick to go out to like consume the next monster on its right, I'd throw Yavin right next to it. So it would, eat, it would either eat Yavin or... He had to play something in the range row to, to get in the way of Yavin. Or he plays an Ekimara to eat that Yavin, but that just creates the same scenario because the Ekimara is going to be buffed to like 20 or 18. Mm -hmm. And then you can use Milva and just return it to hand and you just pretty much made 16 strength on his board disappear for mm -hmm. free pretty much. And it's especially useful if your strongest unit is a Dragoon or a Decoy King of Beggar, which is at 6 strength. So that means you get a useful card that has a great ability, which means you can thin your deck more or buff your unit one more time, and he loses like 20 strength. Awesome. Well, that I think that covers the decks pretty well. Is there anything else you want to talk about with uh, with regard to decks that you've built? Uh, I think it's pretty much important to, depending on your MMR, it change, you have to tech your deck. You have to change your deck. So something that works in my deck might not work in yours because you face different opponents than me. I don't really face any monsters weather, maybe at lower MMR since it's a very cheap deck to build. More people face them, so you have to have you know more first lights in a Skaliga deck or you know ways to deal with that. Um, so it really depends. You have to decide, depending on what you're facing, what to change. And that, again, comes from just game knowledge and understanding um other decks is game plan and and why they want to do certain things and you have to change your deck accordingly something that works in the very high mmrs doesn't specifically mean it's going to work as well in lower mmrs mm -hmm. and vice versa it depends really so whenever you see a deck online that you want to copy or you want to um emulate in your mmr you should keep that in mind depending on what you face you might have to change it a little bit okay um that's really good advice so what are you? What are your plans now? So to, uh, I know you're starting to stream. So maybe you could let people know where they could find you and uh, where you're streaming. And also, I wanted to ask: Are you planning to do that uh, big hundred k tournament that they're having? Unfortunately, I play on Xbox because it's just more. It's easy. I have a laptop now, and I'm building a gaming PC. I still have to. I'm waiting for a part to arrive, and I have to build it myself and all that. So that's why the streaming is kind of on hold for now. But, um, so I'm on Xbox, so I can't access the tournament because 
Um, there's no cross. There's crossplay between PC and Xbox, but not at a private match level. So I can't play the tournament at all and because all my cards and all my decks and everything I've played is on Xbox, and there's no way to transfer that account to PC yet. There will be in the future. Um, I can't really play in any tournaments for now, which is very disheartening, especially because I'm a very competitive player. So it's going to kind of suck seeing people playing the qualifiers and you know being able to play in a 100k tournament in the beta phase is you know a really really big thing and it kind of sucks not being able to be a part of that but i can you know uh write deck guides and you know maybe make some content on youtube and, and stream and stuff to be a part of the community as well so until then until i can access um my account on pc i guess i'm stuck with that yeah and for the streaming and all that i will be streaming maybe in a week's time i should have everything set up so I'm on Twitch TV uh, slash Impetuous Panda. Uh, I think that's that's the URL. So just if you search Impetuous Panda, you should find it. And I will be streaming. Um, I have really enjoyed Gwent a lot, so I will be you know streaming a lot of Gwent. But I might do other games in the future. I'm not sure. I used to do content on YouTube way back in the day, maybe like four or five years ago when it was mm. starting to boom, when Call of Duty was really popular. So I do have some experience with that. Never really got into streaming because Twitch wasn't really too big back then, but I do have experience making content. I will be doing YouTube videos as well, I guess, for Gwent. Okay. With tech guides and different, you know, maybe gen general guides for different mechanics and stuff like that. So, yeah, you can find me on YouTube as well, at Impetuous Panda. But I won't have much con much Gwent content yet. Not for another week, at least. Okay, yeah, awesome. Well, I'll just uh, throw those links down in the description and recommend everybody go over there and subscribe and uh, follow on Twitch because... Uh, and, uh, you know, David really does, he really knows what he's doing. And uh, I think you'll be able to learn a lot about being a high-level competitive player from watching uh, watching him play. And so I've really enjoyed this interview. I've definitely learned a lot. I've taken a lot away from it. Um, I think it'll make me a better player. So I want to thank you for coming on to the podcast um, and hope you have an awesome day. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was really a great experience. I really enjoy these long formats where you can really talk and discuss different things. So it was a pleasure to be here, and I hope people enjoy the podcast and you enjoy playing Gwen because it's a great game.